There'll be a new question, and you can you can you can judge each of the teams on uh, on a on a variety of different different factors. Just so you know, the five things that the judges will be thinking about are originality, uh, how much of a ooh, that was it, execution. Did you actually do anything, or are you still in the uh, the PowerPoint uh, marketing web version? Um, commercial applications, or, or or even social applications of the the project teamwork, how well you work together as a team and, uh, and the quality of your awesome presentations. We will be strict on timings. When we first did this a few years ago, we allowed people to freestyle their presentations and we realized at one o'clock in the morning when we still had seven teams to go that that was perhaps a mistake. Um, now, there are a couple of teams that need to head off early. Now, we will be <laughs> selecting the names at random, but there are two teams that need to make it to the airport. So um, we, we're going to put those in the random name picker first. I'm going to spin the wheel. And the first team to be presenting will be the unconformists. So guys, if you can come along and plug in. Now guys, you'll have four minutes to do your presentation. I just need one second. I'm going to put up the, the uh, question slide. Not that one. Okay, so you can see everyone should have a new question now. Um, at the end of the presentation, submit your uh, your answers. Just here. Good afternoon, everybody. So, and our goal is to transform the way we think about the city. And we are going to present you today the release of our first tool, the unconformity detection. So, the first question is unconformity. Why are they important? So the underpin or understanding of basins, for example, the pre-sin and post-drift um, stratigraphy, they're fundamental to our understanding of prospect evaluation. So they define petroleum traps, they can create migration pathways and also result in the creation of reservoir. And also, if you get your unconformities wrong, it can be a big problem. So I worked for the regulator in the UK and last year. We had an exploration well drilled in a prospect where the unconformity had been mis misinterpreted by 300 meters. So that cost the operator $20 million by drilling the wrong hole. So we are focusing on unconformities and I'm going to we're going to present to you the future of stratigraphic interpretation. To accurately predict unconformity inspired by the fake news industry, we would like to integrate again to solve our business needs. Our workflow involves four steps. First is to prepare the data set. Uh, we, get, we would like to get a ton of data set. We build the Earth model, convert with Vinlet to get our synthetic data. And then the next step, we implement one latest GAN model. It's called image to image, which can convert the seismic image into a labeled image. And then, as you know, uh, in the uh, pre, uh, training data, the training part, machine learning is very computational demanding. So we apply our uh, model on the cloud computing. After that, and uh, we get the result, we can uh, like apply our domain knowledge to do the result QC. So let me show you a demo mockup of our tool. So think about this is Petrel, or this could be your open detect session when you have your seismic data. So you can visualize your seismic and then you say, oh my God, I don't know what this unconformity is all about. I want to have an unbiased model. So I can set my plugin, oh sorry, this is my unconformity detector plugin and open it. So I will show you some of the results for the test data. So you can get your, drop in your seismic line and say predict. And then you can have the synthetic data, the ground truth, and you can see our prediction. So you can see it's very similar than the ground truth. This is another example with a different type of unconformity. 
and then you can have a different prediction models. You see that we're so quite close. And then we say, let's try with real seismic. We haven't trained the model with real seismic yet, so this is the first test of using real seismic. So we select the unconformity, and then we say, okay, predict. You can see the algorithm is trying, but we have a path forward to actually start training the algorithm with real seismic. And Didi is going to present so that. For future release with the aim of doing uh, this October, we have already built some tools that our geoscientists can use to, um, and this tool can help, you know, make tiles and label, which is a prerequisite input to this training model. And then, so, you know, before I come and tell you, oh, we'll offer you the unconformist.ai, I offer you 10% of our company in exchange for $10 million, we, let me just sum up what we did. So, uh, in just one and a half day, we built this proof of concept, first of a kind, deep neural network architecture that can empower the way geoscientists see the stratigraphy. So uh, let us, you know, let us transform the way you understand your stratigraphy. Thank you. Some of these data sets, there's always a lot of uncertainty. And so I'm interested to hear if your methodology provides a measure of uncertainty or if you have to do that. Uh, yes. Uh, so there's two ways to reduce the uncertainty. And the first one is so if we have more data set, and uh, then we can reduce the uncertainty. So that's the, our goal. We want to build uh, our synthetic model to generate a, um, a ton of the training data set. Then we can reduce the uncertainty. Another way is every machine learning algorithm, the outputs they have the probability model. So then they can give the user a sense is how reliable is the result. Then this is the two way we would like to reduce the uncertainty. And then you also have like an unbiased opinion. So when you are doing your interpretation of your own conformity, you can run this and say, I have an unbiased opinion for the algorithm in the conformity book. And you can compare that with your own thinking and your own methods. Yeah? And uh, so uh, for the core computational, the technology part we use is called the image to image, it's a one from ten model. So we inspired by the computational visualization industry. So for this technology, we can be implemented the uh, image and kind of a data set. For us, we borrow this idea and implement it on the seismic data. So we a little bit modify the raw plot. But you can think about future when you can integrate your logs to actually help train your algorithm. So when you're looking at the real seismic data, when you create your labels, you can use real conformities from your log data to help train the algorithm in the future. We haven't got them yet. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to spin the wheel that's got one name in it. So while the wheel is spinning, if Outcrops G Wiz could come up and set up, that'd be great. This guy. Don't pull it too far. Okay, you guys ready? Oh, wait for the. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we're. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Can we pause this a second? I forgot to say to everyone, uh, I'm just going to remind everyone, that's fine. Okay. okay, so 14 people managed to vote for team one, but if you can grab your phones, 
put in your votes for team one. That'd be absolutely fantastic. You'll have the next four minutes to do that. Uh, so put your votes in now. And, um, and then when this presentation's finished, I'll, I'll flick on to the second team. Thank you, sorry about that. Sorry, guys. Okay, so uh, we're team name is Outcrop G Wiz, and that's because uh, these digital outcrop models in the last couple of years have become very popular. Uh, but most of what people do is go, gee whiz, look how cool that is. <laughs> and uh, so we wanted to try to do something a little more. And so you can see, for example, uh, this is a portion of the model that's about 150 meters of stratigraphy. You can see a nice uh, thick sand unit that's right here. And if we zoom into the other portion of the model, then you can see that that sand unit is actually becoming much thinner over here. So our initial uh, sort of goal was to was to go all the way across the model and try to characterize the the sand content, the net to gross of the whole section. We didn't quite get there because these models are very large. Uh, but what we ended up doing was subsetting that data, and uh, and that's what oops, that's what this is. So that's our, this is our team. You can see where we're from, mostly from Colorado School of Mines, uh, DU and Chevron. And uh, you want to take this one? Yeah, so essentially the executive summary of what we did was, what we wanted to do is we wanted to evaluate the phase sheet variability along or with, within digital outcrop models. Uh, the reason we wanted to do this is, well, rapid evaluation of phase sheet heterogeneities allows us to derive some quantitative information and in order to do this, what we did is generated those outcrop models, pulled that into Python, and generated generated a phase sheet classification based on the, looking at the weathering profile and the image color variation along the outcrop. And so moving forward, we're going to focus on refining the workflow, comparing outcrops, and then auto -detect, trying to auto-detect phase sheet boundaries. Okay, so there's two kinds of data when you do these UAV models. One's a point cloud and one's a mesh. And basically, we went with point cloud because it's better for this, but you can read this later. Okay, so, so like I said, this, uh, this, the data for this project is actually coming from uh, drone-derived digital outcrop models. And so that's, these are built using uh, this software called Photoscan. Uh, so this particular model, the one I showed you before, is about an hour of flying time, about 200 photos, and then it takes, you know, basically overnight uh, to process it. And so the nice thing about it is that they're ge the photos come in georeferenced, and so they're uh, so the whole model is georeferenced. So we can just have outputs of meters. And uh, so basically, what we did was we subsetted that model. We draw a line along here, that, like you see, uh, and then we take uh, normal slices. Uh, out of that, out of that model to derive the weathering profiles. Okay, so an example of what that looks like uh, is that black line there. And so, for example, that's that's basically where uh, you know ultimately where the data is coming from. So we have X, Y, Z, and at each point we have an RGB value as well. So in order to do this, we basically will try and speed up here. What we did is we extracted species blocks from the sands, the heterolithics, and the shale within the image. And then evaluated the did an RGB to HSV uh, classifier conversion. Evaluated the distribution of the HSV values within those different facies, um, and we're able to essentially do a decision tree to uh, identify the um, important features. Uh, obviously, what was controlling essentially our facies classification. I guess showing the movie if we can. Here, no. Oh, this one. No. Um, so maybe we can take questions as you watch the movie, uh, which is basically scanning back and forth. that you see here is is as a result of that so that's definitely part of yeah. the part of the reason we chose to convert to hsv though is because those are a little more severable in terms of perceptual qualities like hue should in theory be 
be invariant to illumination or something like that. So if something's like brighter or with more shadowed or something, but it's the same color, the hue should be similar. So like on that last slide, you saw the decision tree ensemble decide that hue is like by far the most important of those like those features. And hopefully that takes care of it a little bit. But when we look at the classification of all the points that we had on the last slide there, you can see that like some of the really dark parts are not are probably not classified correctly. So um, your classification, what scale is it working at? Are you working at pixel by pixel or at multiple pixels on a template? Uh, no, this is it's individual individual pixels. It's not taking into account the context uh, at all. And that would be something to kind of expand on this, but the easiest way to, to do it was just to run all the points through a, through a color classifier, basically. If I had a question, it would be totally appropriate. So, um, anyway, what makes this uh, light photograph your best? Recently? If you had a hyperspectral camera or something like this, do you have any sense of whether this is the data set that that's actually going to capture flashies? You would, you'd probably want both, but the issue is you can get a Phantom 3 for 500 bucks, brand new and they get a hyperspectral camera. I think minimum, you're like looking at a couple grand without a drone to attach it to. So it's something that your average college or uni group can go and buy on Amazon and then 20 bucks of gas and 500 bucks and you're off and running. Yeah, I think including hyperspectral data would be, would be really fascinating. Which, you know, you, you would be getting a better classification having both physical and Right. Thank you very much. Guys. It went to Vimeo, yeah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the judging is now open for team two. Oh, you can vote for yourself, by the way. There's no way of actually, um, uh, I, was, I was controlling this, so we, we decided that the easiest thing to do would be to say, well, yes, you can vote for yourself. And the next team up will be the Jet Loggers. If you could come up, please. Yes, we're the jet loggers, and we decided to have a go at a, a problem, which turns out to be a really hard problem, uh, classifying stratigraphic units. And we could apply this to sigma stratigraphy, uh, or little stratigraphy, or classify reservoir zones. So our input data is a set of uh, wireline logs, and formation top picks. Okay, and we want to try and use NLP inspired methods. Why is because we wanted to try and separate the sequence information from the features. So we set up a, a two-stage process where we do some logs, we do some feature extraction, 
uh, some feature engineering, and then we build a symbol encoder. So we change our portions of our well logs into a stream of letters. We then build a custom code book using our data set, and we use that in a forward pass to create a well log sequence at the bottom. We then use a sequence classifier to read in the, uh, the wells as, as letter and attempt to uh, classify the, the formations with the idea that if the second level specified could learn about the sequences rather than having that all in a one-step process. So there's the wells with the uh, formation tops mapped. On the right-hand side, you have the ground truth in red. So the red shows the formation. And that's actually a sort of scatter histogram of the dots. So that's not showing you the, all the sequence information, but there's some nice kicks against the formation tops. So, of course, we want to see and compare our results with standard techniques. So what we did, we just do some random forex and some uh, shallow MRP to see what, it, what they can predict. And for this task, we just use the basic logs, so BP and so on, at B, and also some augmentation on them on a one meter led, uh, window using statistics like uh, mean, median, other deviation. And then we try to predict only using this data. It's a very difficult problem. You have seen before the logs are very, it's, it's formation. So it's a very difficult to, to get to that. But we have seen a, a score of 0.61 using the other forest on the F1. Uh, uh, micro. Okay, and then so that was our baseline model that we wanted to to have a comparison against. What we used was a was a simple, simplest possible LSTM network. So to learn sequences, it basically scans down the well and then once trained tries to re-predict blind wells and predict the next formation. And the, the results we got out, the best result was on well 874 with a 61% F1 score. But the key thing is to see in the right-hand side that even though the percentage is still high, it's misclassifying lots of, lots of formations. In fact, the score is so high because it happens to get the most popular formation, the biggest formation, it gets right. <laughs> uh, so whether we can use NLP for for this type of thing is still an open question. We think we can. We think separating sequences and the return process is key. And here we've got a very simple LSTM model and we've got various things to prove both in the code book generation and in the, in the sequence classifier. We can build bigger LSTMs and we're still training one next door. That's it, thank you. Doing the symbol encoding as opposed to just going to the raw data. What, what does that do for you? It allows us to deal with a great compact sequence, something that the LSTM can, can produce, so it can, can process. By mathematical deduction, which enables them in uh, you know, normal time to be able to process in an LSTM. Because we condense about 40 features into into that character, into 128 alphabet, and uh, and then that then that's a one D input into the LSTM. Otherwise, you would have 40 sequences going into the same file. And this uh, alphabet also is reminiscent of uh, patient's analysis, where we encode the, the your, our observations as patient classes, and we could also move on to build a second level of associations with the succession and associations of classes. Are they analogous to faces? It's like binding up, In this case, they are generated with uh, some clustering techniques, k-means clustering, but the associations would perhaps try to capture those yeah, kind of succession. Yeah, think about that, like, because one, one thing, one thing to improve on in the code book generation is to use maybe a hierarchical classifier, and then you've got potentially individual letters that go into words, through yes. formations, through to one big class, and then you could potentially draw lines there with larger classes units. Yeah. Um, 
you get your good formations we're interested and that is like word sentences and stuff in NLP language so thank you it's nice well, I'm Yes, uh, it is a really hard uh, problem to solve, as you can see from the results from two days. Uh, it's actually so hard that this is left to sedimentologists and strategists to do in everyday work. But for these guys, it's uh, a lot of manual work to go and pick uh, sequence uh, tops, sequence photographic picks, and lots of webs. So that's the idea with this method to make it high enough quality so that we can automate uh, this process, at least partially. My question would be, do you have any sense of what would happen if you went to a blind well that did not have these? All these are blind wells we show here. All so we, uh, we trained, uh, we had 52 wells. Yeah. We used 42 for training, and you see only the that was blind. So it's totally blind for us. So the result you see here is totally blind. But what was, was there another part of your question? You said well, blind, blind wells that had. Uh, well, I'm just wondering is the assumption of the, of the algorithm as applied that every well would have every member of the sequence? No, no. No, it doesn't have to. Okay. What the LS10 is trying to learn is that after a certain sequence of characters, there's a change that means you move on to a different formation. Starting to do a different sequence, and the hope would be, which we haven't proven, that if a certain pattern doesn't exist, then that formation is. It is a parameter, of course, of also how, how the memory that you want to look back uh, in the past, yeah. in the algorithm, it is a parameter to have to play, to be able to adjust in order to obtain better results. But it is a this process. The question is that. I'm just wondering if this is uh, you know, referring as a, as a unidirectional or a bidirectional sequence. We've only had a single, this is a single LSTM moving forward in time. You looked at encoder decoder type things where you let one part of it see the whole well before another part then generates the decision. And that might be, that might be useful. We also try, we're quite interested in which direction should we be running it in as well, yeah. reverse or forward. But, I think until we improve the quality of the result, we're not going to see people okay, tell us. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, the judging is open for team three if you want to log into your phones and uh, assign your scores. Well. And we will now spin the wheel of fortune again. And the Book Cliffs Bandits. Okay. Greetings is such a, a fortuitous uh, pairing. It's a complimentary. Okay. Um, so Tom and Jesse, we are the Quick Clips Bandits. Um, we picked our game. Uh, we started working uh, some data sets and munching some data um, in the Book Cliffs and um, you know, encountered the common problem that another team is working on today of uh, you know, really not having the perfect ready to go data. Um, so then we wandered uh, north, north slope of Alaska, hearing there was uh, riches in those hills. Um, so we went on our own gold rush caper. I uh, found better data, um, but still not the perfect data ready to go. Um, so our, I'll show you some of that. And it actually led us to kind of reframe 
our goals just a little bit. Um, our overall goals, um, similar to some other folks, was to um, sort of pivot off of the great work that's been done in prior hackathons and, and others of um, making lithology-based correlations and basis predictions and lithology predictions. Um, take a step back from that and reapproach the problem, looking at um, the periodicity and the wealth curves, trying to take a graphic approach and aiming to uh, predictive model that would let you pick um, tops and bases from a sequence stratigraphic perspective and then um, characterize um, those zones and look for like in adjacent wells. So as we went through these, this data set from the North Slope, we quickly, quickly realized that although it is an open data set, there's well logs and there's formation tops. The formation tops are spread kind of far and wide across the internet. They're not present in all wells. So that was kind of our first question is how are we going to classify you know, these intervals of interest from well to well to well if we don't have consistent data? So what we kind of got into um, was looking at a um, basically a change point detection um, using a Bayesian statistics. And we kind of identified some areas where the hyperparameters kind of, um, I think we called it the splitter lumper knob on it. So you could go through and run it through here and it goes through and splits out every single little change um, to be log. Um, and then if you turn it up into splitter mode or into lumber mode, it just kind of groups things more by formation style. Um, so a further area that this can be tuned is actually using some form of uh, machine learning to, or gradient descent or whatever to tune the hyperparameter space and figure out what's optimal for uh, all the different wells in an area. Um, from there, once you have you know, these different intervals kind of picked out using these optimally tuned parameters, um, you can go through and start building these feature sets for all the different wells. So then you can get it into the kind of classifying how, um, classifying from well to well to well based on formations and ultimately getting kind of to the sequence stratigraphic perspective. Um, and this is just a brief result of kind of how our somewhat um, hand-tuned hyperparameters ended up, um, we have pretty consistent picks kind of on this kick across a couple wells and then broke because we have raw log data that hasn't been uh, basically denoised as you can see at the top there. So there's a lot of opportunities going forward from um, kind of what we've started working on. That's it. So does your model jointly consider multiple wells when it's being tested? So it's, at this point, it's just assuming that each well is independent. Um, if you can come in with, you know, a human pick in each well, then that's how you could potentially tune parameters um, for each individual well, but having some kind of standardized standardization from well to well to well. Thank you. When you measure measuring um, the correlation, come out with uh, some pretty uh, precision answers, given uncertainty and evaluation correlation. So that's a great question. You'd like to validate the results against them? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. yeah so, um, so there are some um, extensive tabularized data reported from the 70s um, in stamp hard copy form. And so we were spot checking a couple of items. We had a couple of wells um, that were on cross sections. Um, we kind of skipped past a bit here. We're basically relying on um, published open file reports from the USGS and having to kind of visually check and measure down in section where some of the tops were, see if this was picking reasonably consistent to those events. And if you, um, and more specifically, um, this event, it's a kind of a coarsening upward sequence and has a couple of um, stringers at the base. You see like in that unit with that, here with those two and here with those two. Um, 
are in some of the USGS open file reports, including the ones shown. It just uh, if you go to the GitHub and zoom in a bit, you can um, see that a little bit better. And f future work then being aiming towards like correlation across, but you know more work to do. So we solved kind of the first problem we stumbled across, and now have a nice way to automatically pick tops rather than having to manually transcribe them from ginormous open file report tables, um, spot check them, and then start thinking about the next steps. And it's all on GitHub, so have at it anybody that wants it. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, the judging is open from uh, uh, for team four. Um, I, I will say at this point that um, I've, I've noticed over previous hackathons that the longer we get into the presentations, the less people are excited about voting. But that does have quite a skewing effect because it means that team members who are giving themselves all fives uh, effect. By the way, if there's anybody who is actually watching this online, you can. Uh, you can log into this as well and offer your own uh, perspectives and evaluations. And our next team is the channel runs through it. Hello everyone. So uh, our topic is about automatic channel detection in seismic. So the work is inspired by my SCG abstract for the SCG in California. So um, I'm using the uh, encoder and decoder correlational neural network, which is called SetNet in computer vision, to uh, train uh, in the synthetic seismic data set. So that one is created by James Yenning at BEG in collaboration with Chevron. So we train on that synthetic data set using uh, that kind of model. Basically, we have an encoder and an encoder, and we have a dropout layer to model uncertainty. So after training on that, we will apply with the real data set to pick the channel in seismic. So for the work, uh, during the weekend at Hackathon, we will create more training data set to uh, be suitable with my architecture that's already there. So it will be our job during the, the Hackathon. So yeah, once we looked at what Nam and his colleagues had done previously, uh, what we saw was probably needed most, most was the introduction of more supervised training data based on real data rather than synthetic data. And so that's so uh, the area that we concentrated on. And so this is our uh, our contribution this weekend was a way to much more easily bring in real data into the machine learning process. And so we built a notebook, and this is up on the repo for anyone to go and look at it. And we've concentrated on bringing in the most generic types of data into a format that can be quickly introduced to the uh, the training session. And so it brings in. Um, yeah, the inputs and outputs. Um, control. So 
based on the most generic types of data, um, segway data and horizons that have been interpreted um, this weekend. And then we go through a series of QC steps and then we plot out the uh, an upper layer and the lower layer. And then from that, we extract the geobody. And so there's a time slice of the geobody extraction, a cross section of the geobody extraction. And then we go through, plot that in 3D for some QC. And then ultimately we output it to the formats, the um, array formats required for the machine learning uh, process. And so if we go to the movie and we can watch the movie of the, so this is the extraction that we've got against the background of the seismic that it was extracted from. Cool. So uh, as Graham mentioned, this is out on GitHub. Go grab it. Go go test it out. Go put it into your own deep learning networks to see what you can do. Um, you know, obviously, this is just a first step. The kind of the next phases of work will be really how do you add multiple layers to it? So if you have several different layers that have channels in them, how do you label them all? Also, how do you add different classifications? If you have, say, a channel that you're more uh, confident in or a channel you're lower confident, how do you break those out into different classes and then incorporate that into your, your deep learning framework? And finally, the thing that we wanted to get to but didn't was just a flask app. So that way anybody can just load up two surfaces and the parameters for their seismic volume and actually get out one of these volumes that they can then use to uh, play around with different machine learning frameworks. So with that, uh, any questions? So this methodology for detecting objects that are seismic, is there any limit to the types of objects that can detect, like those small channels, large sheets? Um, so I can show you uh, the animation on the test set that I have. So for the, for the, the, the Python notebook, they just it's 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 uh, a you know, resolution. So as long as you can create an isopack pack between two, you have something you can put into a model. So here is some results we have. So on the left hand side is the field data, and on the right hand side is the general probability. So you can see that there are some region that the channel got very thin there. So the probability map doesn't have good result, but the uncertainty model by the dropout layer can show the geologist that in this area the model has high uncertainty. So we can come and repick that area. So how do you see this being used in an Right, so right now, the, so the, the, what we have to do now for, for this model is we have to generate all this synthetic data and if that, that can take some time to build a model. But there's a wealth of interpretation data that is, is sitting on all kinds of drives that is sitting out there that people can start using. So let's start harvesting that data and turning it into training data. And so uh, whether it be, you know, an algorithm that picks out salt bodies or channels or reefs or something, you can start using this, out, the, the, this, this workflow to start building that basic label data. This is a reef. This is not a reef. This is a salt body. This is not. So uh, I imagine it's something that you could actually put out on, on, on people's work, on workstations and en enable them to start uh, building, you know, what they want to train on. So, I think The input uh, in here it train on the synthetic data and I apply that directly to the field data. So it basically two kind of different things. Like the synthetic is created by human, and the field data has a lot of noise and like fracture or faults in that. So it still performs quite well. So I think that uh, the generalization will be a problem we come from the neural network sometimes. But in my case, if we have enough data, it will not be.
Okay, the, uh, the judging is now open for Team 5. Feel free to uh, uh, add your uh, to that. Our next team will be Geo Hacker. Ready? Ready. Go. All right, everyone. So uh, we're here today to uh, kind of put our money where our mouth is, so to speak. For some time now, we've been talking about uh, a place where we can take geoscience data and put it online uh, in a ready-to-use form for machine learning. Okay. So in 2016, um, as many of you here are aware, uh, I wrote a BASIS uh, classification example article in the leading edge, and it had a simple well log um, suite and showed how to use it and how to get going, and it was really popular. We had a contest, software underground really got kicking then, and uh, it really brought us all together. I started going to hackathons, and it was great. Um, trouble is, there's not a whole lot of data sets out there like that. So a team just before here coming to a hackathon has to spend all these things just to get going. So what we want to do is look at some data sets and create a place where people can go and find these, see what's been done, and get going really quickly. So to that end, we spent our time here uh, looking into a couple data sets, cleaning them up for some machine learning examples, and, uh, uh, and prepping them and putting them online. So what I worked on was uh, we worked on uh, the Poseidon data set and a data set from the UK that Malcolm's going to explain. Um, Poseidon data set has a lot of seismic data, also has a lot of well logs and petrophysical data. So I've shown you an example here. Uh, on the screen of uh, one of the wells, we have white light core photographs, UV photos, CT scans, flood photographs, we have thin sections, as well as, you know, team core analysis results, petrography, colonology, I didn't even look that one up, I didn't know what it was, uh, cuttings, and all of this kind of stuff, and all kinds of weird formats. So we started to tear into this to see what we could do. So I worked with a lot with the core images. So Results are shown here. So I went into all of those image files and the PDFs, cut out all of the images for uh, one of the entire wells, uh, and put them together into a data set where we could start to do some machine learning. Uh, and so shown here are the white life and UV core photographs. And so uh, I used a hybrid uh, convolutional neural network random forest classifier to identify locations where bugs have been taken out of those images. And so you can kind of see the classification results there. Are they area that's found where uh, it thinks is a plug being taken from. So I've only trained it on the circular sort of sidewall plugs, not the end caps. And so as I scroll down here, you can see that it's um, all this data has been prepared and showing the CT alongside here, because now that you've found the plug locations, you could go back to the CT scans and uh, get a sampling of the CT data there to, to use for various upscaling purposes. In addition to the uh, well log data, uh, we also looked at the uh, seismic data. So to do um, ABO and um, uh, sparse by conversions and so on, you need this, uh, the right seismic data and the right well logs in the right place. So Ben looked at organizing this, also using a convolutional neural network to extract uh, deep features from this, which is what the data set is shown here. Malcolm's going to talk about the, uh, the, the UK data set. Hi there, my, my name is Malcolm and, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a geologist, that's, that's the first admission I've got to make. So this machine learning stuff to me is, is very new. So I had to work out how I could contribute here. So one of the things that I've got is a, is a lot of data as a geologist and I've got a lot of knowledge of what that data could be used for and how it should look. So what, what I've tried to do is take a, 
an open data set that, that we've got that's that's very messy and I've tried to clean it up in a way that, that I understand as a geologist and present it in a way that can then be accessed by people that do understand machine learning and they can then go away and work with it, push it back, and that can allow me to learn a little bit about how machine learning works for the industry and it also works the other way and it helps give some of that domain knowledge back to people doing machine learning. Thank you very much. So we didn't do that. We just looked at uh, core plugs because they were there and so, somewhat semi-obvious. But uh, this is all online now. That clean data set is there with the notebooks that show how to access it, how to load it up, how to spin through it uh, in a pipeline in machine learning. So yes, that's imminently possible now that you have CT, uh, UV, and the uh, um, white light all aligned. So is it fair to say that you've approached the team with some of the really brutally clinical data management projects rather than your contention with a higher value than necessary to do that? That's right. I wanted to create a tool that uh, we wanted to create a platform where people could show up to a hack on, for example, or on their own, own time and say, you know what, I want to hack on the um, Poseidon data set and you know it's kind of ready to go for machine learning if I grab this packet of wells that's been aligned and these talks and so on and so maybe you want to do some image analysis and I want to design a fracture detector well you know here's this well that's already been cleaned and you know I've separated out the core core labs logos from these images and uh, color bars and so on and I just got the data and I can I think if I can add as well from my perspective from the perspective coming from the geological side of things, the, the opportunity there for managing the, da the, the data is a way that it integrates the domain knowledge a little bit into it as well. And again, that uh, you know, allows me to learn a little bit as well as to teach at the same time. Yeah, I have always, uh, you're just taking your feedback, I think you identified actually a really thorny problem, which is, you know, how do you get people working on some standard problems? It might be a data sharing, data discovery, right. But one of the things that I'm concerned about is that more interested in would be the platform idea. Uh -huh. Is that many different organizations, whether they're governments or small organizations or whatever, have these data centers. Right. And they have a certain amount of energy to clean them up and a certain amount of willingness to make them work. But that is a very diverse amount of resources right. to actually put to that. And I have wondered if the right approach is not so much to create you know, like the one spot where people can find them, but right. could actually create a protocol or a server protocol yep. that people could compare their data towards, and then they could each run their own data server plans. Yep. That you know, almost you, you know what I'm. I'm sorry, I know. I, I, I agree with you. I'm just curious, like what, how you what you design. Yeah, like, I don't. The problem you're trying to solve, as opposed, to, like I mean, I understand that you you take two data sets forward That's this right. weekend, which is wonderful, but. But I'm just curious what the real problem is, what's that platform? Yeah, so I have two answers to that. I know what it's not. And it's not the government uh, databases where you go in and it shows you a text form to say, type in what you want. And then it spits out this long list of data that is kind of all over the place. And maybe you have to order a disk and it's in all these weird formats. Or you got now you've got to write a text parser to look through all this stuff and extract what you want. And that takes forever. That doesn't get anybody going working on the problems they want to, to work. So discoverability is a big thing. When I go to the Geoscience Australia website to look up this stuff, unless I know it's in the browse basin, it's really hard to find that. Um, two, the machine learning article tutorial in 2016 in the contest that Agile and, and, and we ran together was amazingly effective. And that was in a GitHub repo with just some you know, notebook was there to show how to use it. Go, can you do better? That was, that was effective. So um, it doesn't have to be a centralized platform. So we have a GitHub repo. This data and our projects are in there. You can, you can, you can access that and, and get going. And uh, I think that perhaps, you know, something like the UCI website that has machine learning um, examples in there can point out to various places where people have, have, have done these things before. So 
that's a possibility. But you're right. I don't think that there's one protocol that's going to solve everybody's problems. Um, but uh, this is a small step in that direction. Thanks, everyone. Okay, judging is uh, is open for team six. Okay, we've had the unconformist already, haven't we? Well, if they come up, we'll move them. Okay, uh, Petra Dix, uh, you guys are up. Uh, afternoon, we're going to be talking a little bit about our project. We actually uh, put together an intelligent cloud-based uh, petrophysical lithology detection or prediction tool. Uh, we actually went in uh, and as the user interface, uh, you would actually upload a triple combo log. Uh, Petrodict would then do that, go through that and then provide back to you that log with uh, fractional lithology logs back to you. So we went through and we pulled down a bunch of, or we pulled in a bunch of logs uh, from downhole ECS logs, went through, cleaned that stuff up, uh, did some testing on that, uh, trained the model, did some optimization, and then packaged it all up for you guys. Uh, we ended up settling in at, after that testing with the random forest model. And currently we're running, uh, in comparison with an actual downhole tool, we're running at about 86% accuracy. Uh, as it stands with the current training data set. Uh, we're actually going to hot swap here real quick <clears throat> and do a demo for you guys. So actually go in, we'll pull her up, you'll pick your triple combo log. it on the tool. She'll choose for a bit and then you can pull up your results and we'll be adding in so you can download this as well. And then you can actually view your log, the lithology, uh, the fractional lithology log on the website itself. So. <laughs> yeah. So, do you guys have any questions? <laughs> 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 I have a question. Yeah. The full Thanks. I'm just going to do that. Uh, well, we, uh, we go to uh, see the whole list of options. Okay. Those are the ones that kind of have your own model. Have your own model. You get to Another one to add on accuracy is actually, so we use logs out of Colorado only, because um, that's ones I have available. So expanding my scraping in order to get a bigger training data set so it works in other areas and other basins. So, 
So if I take a brand new data set and I apply this tool, does it apply all those different machine learning methodologies and then optimize those hyperparameters and the one for me, or what am I doing? Not yet. We need some more capital to avoid that. Right now, we make it top model. It's on the other laptop. So we need to be kind of do two different routes because we have the multiple outputs variables. We predict like four different mnemonics, four different terms. So we initially go out and do one at a time. I'm picking the top model we call each one of them. And then we like, man, this is a lot of work. You know, and then at the end you have to make a lot of prediction and put together a data set. So we explore in the multi-output model and which is a random forest supported. So we kind of run through the one time and then spit out all all of the output. So we settle on that, even though the the accuracy is a little bit less. Instead of the individual. Okay. Okay, the judging is open for Team 7 now. So I think there can only be one outcome of this. It's either the, uh, the, the team that have gone home already, uh, or Size Miser. I'm hoping Size Miser are going to win, but that was awkward. I'll try spinning the wheel one more time. <laughs> and will they win? Yes. <laughs> Size Miser, your time is done. Good evening, everyone. So the project is Size Mysore, and we all are like college undergraduate students. We are here for this hackathon. We really don't have like geoscience <laughs> domain. But our objective was to study and analyze and use earthquake wastewater injection data and then use machine learning and data analytics to predict where and induce seismic event would be likely to occur from the given fault data and the injection well data and induced earthquakes. As all you guys know, it's because of the human activities such as water based disposal through well injection, which is the main reason behind the earthquakes. That is like 90%. And the major event occurring is in Oklahoma State. The main reason behind with induced earthquake is the wastewater injection. And from here. Okay, so we used uh, a few data sets. Um, we used uh, some earthquakes from 2010 to 2016. Uh, we got it from the USGS uh, website. And we used the wastewater injection data, which I'm not exactly sure where we got that because one of them got it. Um, and then a fault map that we found um, from the Oklahoma Geological Survey. So we did some pre-processing on the well and earthquake data so that we could create some data that we could actually use to train the network. 
And to do this, we used like a simple filtering mechanism to filter out some of the obviously, some of the wells that obviously did not influence the seismic event. And then we used like a simple heuristic to um, choose which well we think was most likely to have caused the event. And like it's explained here, but I don't really need to go into it. And then we planned, but we're not able to implement in the given time constraints to uh, train a deep neural net with the given fault line data, well data, and quake magnitude as inputs and quake location as an output, and thus giving the model to predict where a quake of a given magnitude caused by given well data and local fault data would occur. So here's just like a little bit of a diagram to kind of explain the heuristic. So from the knowledge that I was taught yesterday by some of you guys, um, we, the main influencing factor is that the pressure from the, the well injection travels along the fault lines causing the events. And so we wanted to weigh, we wanted to measure the angle, like the offset from the fault line, the farther offset it is from the fault line, the less likely it is that the pressure could actually travel down and cause an event. So we like measured the distance and measured the, the angle and had weighted the angle more heavily because of course, if it's not aligned at all, it's almost impossible for to causing an event. And we think that this, a model such as this could be adapted to predict the possible dangers of well placement and operation to nearby air, urban areas, allowing industry to test where induced quakes of different magnitudes might occur given planned well placement and operation. Uh, we couldn't, we kind of like way overestimated the availability of data um, since we have no geoscience background, and um, that was a big constraint to us. Um, yeah, we were also unable to find focal mechanism data for the quakes, which would have been really nice because that would have helped characterize the events better than just the magnitude and location. Um, yeah, that's about it. Well, we, in the heuristic that we were using to decide, uh, where is it? You can see, what, like, this volumetric flow parameter right here in the division. We actually did the volumetric flow for the last three months. I was not aware that there was, like, a, like a time lag. I don't know how long the time lag is likely to be, but I guess we could have adjusted that for distance and the time. But we only took the last two months of volumetric flow because we know that if there was no flow, then there's probably no um, impact. So we access the data channel, which is one we did every day of the week. Does the data exist and you just haven't been able to kind of randomly identify find it? A lot of the data is held by industry and is not publicly available. That's like that's most of it actually. Most of it's just it's it's locked behind industry like paywall basically. But there a lot of it does exist and it's hard to process and it's in odd formats and they're not consistent, like you said. But I think most of it is just that the data does exist, but industry is holding on to it. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. We targeted water injection because from what we read, it seemed like that was the main, the, the main factor that everyone else was focusing on. And having no background, we had no way to know what else to tackle. Thank you for your question.
Now, did we miss any teams? Is there anybody sitting there going, hang on a minute, let me, let me, let me. Thank you very much. Okay, so I've moved the uh, scoring on to um, Team 8, so please feel free to uh, put, your, uh, put your votes in for, for Team 8. Uh, this is the moment where the judges are going to disappear off, we're going to cogitate and contemplate uh, and, uh, and evaluate the different entries. Uh, that means it's your chance to grab a beer, relax. Um, I will just say, everybody, I, I'm always blown away by what can be achieved in two days. So really, good job. And, and for those people who in their minds are thinking they want to carry on and, and, and pursue some of these things, one shout I'm going to give you is we're currently running an AI challenge. It's a global contest for people who want to develop uh, applications of AI-related technology. And, um, I'm, I'm the energy CTO, so I'm very keen for lots of energy entries uh, to go into the competition. And um, the, the thing I'll say about it is this, is there, there are two reasons why participating could be cool. One is you'll get access to a gigantic deep learning supercomputer. Uh, over in uh, our Round Rock HQ, we have uh, a couple of the largest supercomputers on the planet. Um, we're providing access to those to the finalists of the competition. Secondly, if you're one of the winners, then uh, you could either get, I think, 200,000 core hours on uh, on our big supercomputer, uh, or if it's uh, if it's a an energy specific uh, entry that has uh, possibility, then we're actually uh, going to support the winners by uh, commercialising and building a go to market for the the ultimate solution. So just a quick shout out, just Google Dell EMC AI challenge, ping me on Slack if you've got any questions. Entries close at the end, end of May. Um, the, we do ask people to submit a video, but it is completely optional. You don't have to put a video in, just a one page abstract saying, I've got a crazy idea, we want to do a thing, just to a giant supercomputer so I can see if it would ever actually work. Okay, so on that happy note, grab a beer. Uh, I'm going to grab the judges, we're going to go and cogitate and contemplate, and we will be back to you as soon as we can. So before we uh, start, I'd, I'd just like to give a quick shout out to uh, the guys from Agile Geoscience. Yes. They have um, an almost unnatural passion for running these community events. And I can assure you they don't do it because this is what's buying their, uh, their jets and their luxury holidays in Hawaii. They do it because they're passionate about it, they believe in it, they believe in developing the community. Um, I think what they do, you know, it's hard to communicate the level of organization and running around that's involved in putting an event like this together. So, um, Evan, Diego, um, Matt, who's not here, but um, has, has contributed in his own unique way. Thank you very much, guys. It's been amazing. <laughs> A bunch of other volunteers like uh, Graham, who's always running around, contributing, working hard at these events. And there are other people who I'm sure I forget to mention, but to everyone who helped make these events what they are, I say thank you very much. <laughs> and without further ado, we will, uh, uh, we will we'll get on with the judging. So uh, I'm going to invite, uh, I, I, by the way, to give the other judges an opportunity to introduce themselves. So uh, as they come up, uh, they'll, they'll have a chance to say the names. But I'm going to invite Michael to come up and give the uh, Societal Impact Award. Thank you very much, David. Um, yeah, just to introduce myself, I am Michael Perch. I'm a professor at University of Texas, Hildebrand Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering. 
my pleasure to be here. Um, also, I'm Geostats guy on Twitter. If anybody wants to follow me, um, um, being a fan monkey there. So basically, um, we thought that was very important to recognize the fact that um, machine learning has an important impact on society. Um, that it has a great opportunity to add value. And so we wanted to give an award for societal impact. And when we think about the energy industry and machine learning, we realize that the induced seismicity problem is one that impacts our very social license to practice. It can be the difference between a future and not having a future in energy. And so um, with no further ado, we wanted to give that to um, Seismizer. Um, And so what we have for you here are these really cool um, digital microscopes with flexible necks. So you're able to plug this up to your computer and be able to use this as a microscope. Please come around, we'll get a picture together, right? We can get a picture together. Me, please do that. All right, thank you. Very much. Um, yeah, there's only three. I, I get the fun job of um, presenting the award for uh, commercializability, mostly because I was the only judge who could pronounce that. And, um, you know, whenever you look at the, these projects, I, I'm always blown away by what people manage to put together in, uh, in just a couple of days of hacking. Um, but there was one project in particular that everybody seemed to agree had great uh, commercial uh, opportunity. And so, without further ado, I'd like to invite the unconformists up to receive the award for commercializability. And we have, instead of checking his list. So in the, um, in, in the interest of extending, I've got the wrong box, brilliant. Oh, the box is in front of me, you took them out of the box for me. Okay, uh, in the interest of extending the, uh, your, your supercomputing capabilities, we have these fabulous neural compute sticks. This is like a miniature version the supercomputer I bought with me. So there you go. I didn't have some fun with that. I think we'll have to Yeah, I'm now going to invite uh, Fraser up. He's going to give the teamwork award. <laughs> so I just introduced myself. Uh, my name is Fraser Kepi. I have a fairly uh, convoluted background in academics and in industry, uh, but I'm a structural geologist and a computer programmer. And I'm from Nova Scotia, so I actually met uh, Matt through family connections. He lives in Mahone Bay, where some of my uh, in-laws live and then I became a client actually of Agile to do some of the um, computing tasks that we have in our in our uh, government organization to process data. So it's a real privilege to finally be at one of these hackathons even if I don't get to be a participant which hopefully I will get to do another time but it's been a real pleasure to see all the projects and the work you guys did over the weekend. Um, the award for teamwork um, we're going to give to Outcrops G Wiz. We thought they had a really nice presentation that showed involvement from all three, all four members. And we're giving out uh, what I believe is an Arduino kit. It's an Internet of Things kit. And yeah. we were thinking that as one of the prizes, they potentially they can actually go up on the drones. And oh, the drones. Nice. And so. Yeah, 
Okay, so I'm also going to present our fourth and final award, um, which we've named for execution. Um, we might also have given it for presentation. I think there was a little mic drop in the middle of their in their presentation. But so so for execution, in terms of uh, the problem, the definition, and what it appeared they were able to deliver over the course of the weekend, the prize goes to um, Petrodit. Are, what, what, which are these again? Okay, yeah, so the prize is um, cameras that you can connect to your computer and do, do machine learning on the pictures you're taking sort of in real time. Can we, bit, can we come in a little bit tighter, a little bit more friendly? Okay. <laughs> like you spend all weekend together in that warm, sweaty room. All right, thank you guys. Thank you. And I just have one very quick announcement before I thank you all very much for being here with us. And that is, if you're around on Wednesday afternoon, please come to the Machine Learning Un session and tell all the others about it. Uh, there's a couple people in this room who are hosting it, and, and we'll all be there. It, so it's not going to be like sitting in a room of a bunch of PowerPoint talks. It's going to be the opposite of that. Twelve or more conversations going on. There's, uh, and we're going to try to continue uh, having conversations around this. Uh, the theme of machine learning and how we can bring more of these uh, emerging technologies into uh, this domain. So yeah, please tell all your friends about it and we'll be handing out posters and, and uh, little flyers about it over the course of the convention. So I think it's in group 251 e Wednesday afternoon. Uh, and lastly, I just want to say thank you so much. It's been a lot of fun and I appreciate that uh, the courage that uh, and maybe the commitment that you guys have shown to uh, come out and do something new. And um, it's, it's a really rewarding experience to connect with uh, folks like you. So um, thanks for, very much uh, for everyone for all your hard work. Um, like, I think uh, like I'm, I'm amazed at all the things that uh, everyone is able to achieve. Basically, go, a lot of people went from like zero to deep learning in 37 hours or something like that. Right, so let's give us all yourselves a big round of applause. And, uh, According to my clock, it's two minutes before the ice break starts. Um, so we're on time. And you're welcome to stick around and hang out. There's beer. Um, I'm going to slowly be tidying up. I'll turn the music back on. We can stay as late as uh, Skyler's patience and wants to kick us out of here. But uh, if you're going to the icebreaker convention, we'll see you there. If not, we'll see you next time. And see you on Slack, I guess. Um, OK, take care. Bye. <laughs>